I got a lot of questions about some recent headlines, according to which the universe had a dark Big Bang, a second hidden origin that offers potential evidence for, yes, for what, I wonder. I had a look. The universe expands, which means that if you go back in time, matter must have been denser. If you use Einstein's equations to calculate just how densely matter was packed, the density becomes infinite at a moment approximately 13.7 billion years ago. And yes, for anyone wondering, density becomes infinite is physicists' way of saying we have no idea what's going on here, but we have a name for it. It's what we call the Big Bang, the first moment of our universe, according to Einstein's theory of general relativity. In the past decade or so, some science communicators have unfortunately begun using the word Big Bang for something else entirely, namely the creation of matter in the already existing universe. But in the currently used theories, these are two separate events. Physicists believe that at the beginning of time, at the creation of the universe, there was no matter in the universe. There was just energy in the form of a field called the inflaton field and its potential. This field eventually decays into matter, that's normal matter and dark matter. And this creation of matter has now also been referred to as the Big Bang. In the physics literature, the creation of matter is more technically referred to as reheating, like, you know, a microwave oven does. Beep, beep, your cosmos is ready. I really wish that science communicators wouldn't conflate reheating with the Big Bang because it causes no end of confusion but here we are. The Dark Big Bang now uses the word Big Bang to refer to the creation of matter, and the idea is that normal matter was created first and then dark matter later. It was created in a rather similar way from the decay of a new field, which they just call phi. I find this very disappointing. I mean, after Dark Big Bang, you really expect something more intriguing, like universal essentia, or cosmic continuum, or maybe Tim. Yes, I really think they should have called it Tim. But what type of dark matter does Tim decay into? Here's where things get interesting, because so far physicists have almost always assumed, for no particular reason really, that dark matter doesn't just have mass and sits there and attracts other matter. They also assumed that it does something else, that it has a small probability to interact with normal matter. This is why physicists built all these detectors to look for dark matter particles. They didn't find find anything which they want you to believe is progress, but, well, judge for yourself. The issue is, there is no particular reason why dark matter needs to interact with normal matter other than by its gravitational pull. This possibility has become known as the nightmare scenario of gravitationally coupled dark matter. We talked about this in an earlier episode. The problem is that in this case, there is basically no way you can figure out what properties dark matter particles have. Also, we thought, because these physicists who work on the dark Big Bang say that even in the nightmare scenario, we'd still be able to measure the properties of the dark matter particles. It's because this second dark Big Bang, when dark matter was created, would have been a rather violent event, a first order phase transition from Tim to dark matter. This creates bubbles of the new dark matter, very much like when you boil oil water. These bubbles then join to larger ones. The thing is that this is a quite abrupt process and that creates gravitational waves and these gravitational waves we might be able to measure. The general idea of the Dark Big Bang was proposed already last year. In the new paper they now calculate what are suitable ranges for the parameters of the model like the details of the phase transition and the particles that it creates. You see here the white region is the range of parameters which is not yet ruled out. And you also see that you can rule out a bigger part with some upcoming gravitational wave experiments that are the green and yellow regions cutting out a piece of the white part. By the way, this video comes with a quiz that lets you check how much you remember. Well, the authors of these papers nicely follow the playbook of theoretical physics. 
First, you make up a new theory that's unnecessary to explain any existing observations. Then you fumble the details together so that it hasn't been ruled out already. Then you claim that something interesting can be measured with some upcoming experiment. But it won't be measured. How do I know this? Because this is the same strategy of theory development that the people in this research area have used for decades. It's never worked before and will never work. There are infinitely many of such mathematical ideas to guess from, so the probability of anyone being correct is 1 over infinity, which is zero. But this also means that there are infinitely many papers left to write, and I can make infinitely many more videos about them, so don't forget to subscribe. I love talking about science, not just because it's interesting, but also because it's inspiring. That's why I'm always looking for new science stories. My favorite starting place is Nautilus magazine. And if you're also looking for information and inspiration, you should really have a look. Nautilus is a science magazine that keeps you up to date on the most relevant topics that are being discussed today. They frequently have scientists writing for them who will tell you the inside stories. Nautilus comes with a digital and a print version and you'll notice immediately that it's a high quality production. I can tell you from my own experience with them that their editors are really working hard to make the writing sparkle and the illustrations are really artworks. I've written several contributions for Nautilus myself, mostly about physics, black holes, quantum gravity and quantum mechanics. But I enjoy this magazine because it tells me what's going on in other areas. What I particularly like about Nautilus is that they cover all areas of science, from astronomy to economics, history, neuroscience to philosophy and physics. They'll pick the most relevant topics and give you all the context. You can join Nautilus as a digital only member or get a print subscription. In addition to full access to all the stories in Nautilus, members receive benefits like priority access to events, exclusive products and product discounts. And of course, I have a special offer. If you use my custom link joinnautilus.com slash Sabine, you'll get 15% off your membership subscription. So go check this out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.